Hey, what is up you guys? It's me, Emrick, and welcome back to movies. Um, and yeah, little show I sit down every Monday, apart from last Monday because I did something different. Sue me. I talk about a movie, last party on Emma. This week, we're making a return. We are coming back, 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 back again to Passion Flick. Now, I kind of love passion flicks, I'm not gonna lie. They're a streaming service that makes kind of X-rated horny movies that are adapted from New York Times best-selling erotic novels and I find them hilarious. And I think the thing that always really gets me about them is that they take books, slap it onto a script, and whoever is their screenwriter really just doesn't bother to make it sound like a person would actually say this because a lot of the times when you're reading something you don't actually have to witness the person saying this cringy shit out loud and then when you do it's just like ooh. And so today we are reviewing part three of the ongoing passion flick series Gabriel's Inferno. You know who my father is? He's my avenging angel. Sonnets could be written about your mouth. Is that because I'm a frigid bitch? So a quick little recap for anyone who hasn't watched part one and two, you can find my full reviews in the Movies in the Mug playlist, but in case you want me to walk you through the story so far, Gabriel's Inferno focuses on uh, two people, Julia and Gabriel. And Gabriel is Julia's Italian history or like Italian literature professor. And she is a master's student. So, you know, sexy teacher and all that good shit. The two of them knew each other from childhood because Julia is best friends with Gabriel's sister. And Gabriel was like adopted into a family who live in Canada and or upstate New York. I don't think it's ever really specified because he was like an orphan. And then later in life, find out that his birth parents or at least birth father was super, super rich and then got a lot of money, but also had like a drinking problem. And then Gabriel molested Julia in a field when she was 17 and he was like in his mid twenties. And then in the second movie, they had a really big fight and they made it really apparent to everyone in like their master's class that they were fucking. But then, you know, the power of love or whatever. So they get back together. But then at the end of the second movie, Julia gets a very ominous phone call from someone called... Steven? He's in this movie, so I should know. Approximately 10 hours later. Simon. Simon. Gets a very ominous phone call from her ex named Simon, who she mentioned never hurt her, but did call her a frigid bitch for not wanting to fuck him after five years or something, something along those lines. Again, you can go back and watch my actual reviews of those videos, but that's basically all you need to know to get where we are today. Julia is super meek and mild, which is why I call her Miss Meek and Mild. And Gabriel is like this hot headed, bad tempered, cryptic, Italian dude, angry man TM. Oh, and to make this a bit more fun for anyone who has watched the other two videos, I've started to notice certain, you know, trends in these films. So I made a bingo card. <laughs> so before I sat down to watch it, I just had a think and I was like, Hmm, what do I think is gonna happen in this movie? And as we go through the movie, if I get one right, you have to take a shot. And if I miss one at the end of the movie, I'll take a shot for everyone that I miss. So like, if number two happens during the course of the movie, I'll point it out, you take a shot. If at the end of the movie, I have six left over, I have to take six shots. Them's the rules. This is the game we're playing. Toot toot, beep beep, get on board, bitches. So the bingo card is as follows. Steve can't go outside. <laughs> now, I don't mean that he physically won't be outside. I just mean that Steve will not have anything to do in this movie whatsoever, other than to sit next to Julia and make Emerson jealous. And for anyone who doesn't know, Steve is like the guy who they were gonna, I guess, maybe try and set up a love triangle with, but then just couldn't be bothered and then didn't. And now he just kind of hangs around 
in the background, not really doing anything, but being very nice and supportive to Julia. Then I put someone get shot, question mark, because I feel like there hasn't really been any stakes in this series. You know, there hasn't really been any action. For the third one, I put Gabriel likes feet. And now hear me out. I feel like he's a fuck guy because there have been a couple of times throughout the first two movies where I think it was implied that he was into feet and he kind of looks like a foot guy. Next up we have Dom Julia sub Gabriel and like I don't think they're gonna do it because I think the production studio are cowards but if you watch part two there was this character introduced called Professor Payne and she was like a BDSM dom who apparently had a sexual relationship with Gabriel and slapped him around a bit, made him her little bitch boy, probably pegged him, kind of hot. And I really thought that that was like an avenue that they should explore. But given the audience for these movies, I really don't think they're going to. I feel like I'm gonna have to take a shot for that one, but we can dream. The next one is Orchard cameo. Now in the first movie and in the second movie, they really talk a lot about this orchard. You know, the orchard where Gabriel touched Julia inappropriately when she was 17 and he was in his mid twenties. But I don't know, it's the third movie. I feel like they're gonna go back to the orchard. Next up is pretty much a dead cert. I just put Julia stays mild. She has big NPC energy, if you know what I mean. Like. She's not the playable character in her own existence. Next up, we have They Bang, and it's been three movies. What are we all here for? What are we waiting for? It's been a while, and she hasn't even given him a sloppy toppy supreme at this point. Okay, two more left. Um, I think it would be really funny if it turned out that Gabriel was not really Italian, and that this whole thing was just like a long con, and he just kind of like engineered his way into these people's lives and was actually a sociopath. I think I'll probably have to take a shot for that one as well, but you know, we have to keep this fair. And finally, Probably my favorite that I was really excited to figure out if it would happen. Black and brown people are not allowed to talk. <laughs> we have had, you know, two pretty sizable movies at this point and not a single character of color with a speaking role. And I'm interested to see if they'll carry on with that trend. I guess brown people can't study classic Italian literature and that's fair, you know because we can't read. Okay, so we will revisit the bingo card at the end of this video, and with that, let's get going. Okay, so one of the things I was considering putting on my bingo card, but I thought would just be, you know, too easy and a little bit unfair, is that they still won't have changed their intro sequence, and we will still have to sit through five goddamn minutes of lacrimosa. <laughs> and we still have to suffer through the exact same intro sequence. Oh my god. But one thing I will give the movie credit for is that they come in hot. Julia ended the last movie on the phone to this ex-boyfriend and you know I think the writers realized that they didn't have a villain in this story other than Gabriel and so Julia's ex just comes straight in with Hey bitch, you have some pictures that belong to me. What these pictures actually are, we don't know. And perhaps more importantly, we never find out. Like we don't even get a hint. And instead of just saying, hey, can you like, I don't know, we transfer them to me or whatever the fuck. He's like, I want these pictures. And if you don't give them to me, I'm gonna send your dad a video of you sucking my dick. And this is like, Within the first two minutes. Honestly, I appreciate a movie not wasting my time. At least if you're gonna make me sit through 11 minutes of lacrimosa, you can get this going quickly, and you did. Thanks. But if we know anything about Julia, it's that she deals with every situation the same way, which is by running off and crying. So she does that, she runs off and goes, to sit fully clothed in a bathtub while Gabriel takes the phone and he's like, listen, you little prick, you ever come near Julia again, I'm gonna beat your ass, which fair enough, I guess. But then the movie did a really good job of making me hate Simon because he replied to Gabriel's rant with, 
Do you know who my father is? And if there is anything that makes me want to beat someone's ass, it is that sentence. I... <laughs> oh my God. Any grown adult who utters the phrase, do you know who my father is? deserves just to be backhanded right in the face, right then and there. Just like, pow, straight in the nose. But then to add insult to injury, I mean, this bitch is already, you know, crying in the bathroom. Gabriel just takes her phone and just throws it on the floor and breaks it. And it's like, rude, that was at least an iPhone 5S. Disrespectful. But you know, for as shitty as Gabriel has been in the past movies, he does give Julia some really good and what I would consider quite comforting advice. We'll get my lawyer, we'll sit down and we'll figure out the best way to keep you protected, which, you know, is like the one reasonable thing he's ever said. So I'm on board. All that out of the way, the two of them decide to go back to the town where they're from, which I don't know where it is. And like, they're trying to keep their relationship a secret because, you know, Gabriel is still her professor. They're really bad at keeping it a secret, just FYI. I would just like to point that out right now. And oh, time to tick one off my bingo card already because we have an orchard cameo. Take a shot. Then they have like an uncomfortably long makeout session with no music over it. So it's just a lot of a heavy breathing. I also think it's kind of awkward because Gabriel's like, oh yeah, I really wanted to fuck you from the first moment I saw you. And it's like, dude, stop reminding us that she was 17 and you were in your mid twenties, not making anyone like you anymore. And then Julia decides to, you know, step it up a notch. And she's like, mm, so intense. And he's like, well, if you think that's intense, it's a good job you don't know what I'm thinking. And then Julia's like, oh yeah? Fucking tell me, daddy. Fucking tell me what you're thinking. Talk dirty to me, daddy. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe she didn't say that exactly, but I'm reading between the lines. I think Gabriel has to ruin it by telling her that he wants to make love to her. And I'm like, this is not the time. I can choke me, spit in my mouth and don't look me in the eyes. But then, you know, the movie reminded me that Julia is a virgin because, you know, hashtag Miss Meek and Mild. He's like, just FYI, just before you, you know, get all attached and stuff. I had a vasectomy. Um, so if you want to have kids, uh, you're not going to be doing that with me. Okay, so cut to like Thanksgiving or whatever celebration they're there to celebrate. And Julia is at her dad's house and Gabriel is at his family's house and they're texting back and forth. And then all of a sudden, Julia's ex Simon like breaks into her house and he's like, Hey bitch, give me my pictures back. And in order to get them, apparently he's just prepared to assault her. So he throws her against the couch and then bites her like really bad until she bleeds. So she bitch slaps him and then runs away. But this bitch runs up the stairs. Girl, have you never seen a fucking horror movie in your life? You never run up the stairs, bitch. They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. But then somehow Gabriel like arrives at the house because I don't know, I guess he had like some ESPN or whatever about like her getting attacked. So he shows up and then he just beats this guy's ass, which sometimes violence is the answer. And uh, yeah, he kind of deserved it. Afterwards though, Julia gets interviewed by like the police and I'm like, oh my God, the policewoman is black. There's a person of color and she's gonna have a line. I'm gonna have to take a shot. I got my bingo card up. I was gonna cross it off and um, nope. They didn't let her say a single fucking word. They put music over her. So all she did is stand there and go. So after this, they're having a chat and my spidey senses start tingling. I'm like, oh, you know, they had this nice moment. So clearly something stupid is about to pop off. So Gabriel is topless and Julia asks why he has the name Maya tattooed on his chest. And he has this like 
really fucking ugly tattoo of a dragon or something. And he just doesn't respond to her. He just kind of like pensively stares at the camera. And I was putting the pieces together and I was like, well, I mean, the movie told me that he had a vasectomy for no reason. And then Gabriel also says that like, he loved Maya, but like it wasn't in a romantic way. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe he has like a secret child or something. Like that's something that these movies have. Like, remember The Protector, the other Passion Flicks movie that we reviewed? There was like a secret child in that that he never saw for some reason. So yeah, probably some kind of secret baby. But before we can get to the bottom of it, we cut back to, I guess, their university class and Paul is there, so the bingo card is out. Let's see if they let Paul go outside. And no, Paul has about three lines in this movie and that is all we see of him. Paul never gets to go outside, take a shot. Okay, so now things are about to get truly stupid. So buckle in, sweaty. So we have a montage of Gabriel like sitting in a big velvet chair and looking all pensive. And then Julia comes over and she's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, what's the issue, brah? And this dramatic bitch, this dramatic bitch, he looks at her and he's like, I'm a murderer. <laughs> and the way he says it is honestly, it's kind of like he knows. It's like, it's almost, it's. It's so close to breaking the fourth wall. It is so close to just staring down the camera and going, huh? Huh? We needed a twist. Huh? <laughs> it's really funny. Could you imagine you walk into this dude's house and he sat on a big velvet chair, listening to classical Italian music, drinking scotch, and then he tells you he's a murderer. I'd be like, oh fuck, this is it for me. I'm gonna be on a Bailey Sarian video in about six months. But anyway, he says that he took an innocent life and the innocent life that he took was the life of his daughter, who was Maya. So I was right, he did have a secret child. I just didn't anticipate that the secret child would be dead. But obviously, like, he's still our main romantic lead. So he can't be an actual child murderer. So then we get the backstory, which is that whilst he was at university doing his master's degree, that he was like addicted to coke and that he started a casual sexual relationship with a lady whose name was Paulina. And then she gets pregnant. He throws some money at her and tells her to get rid of it. But we have a plot hole right here because he says he was studying in Oxford. And if he was studying in Oxford, that means that this was taking place in the UK. And if this was taking place in the UK, he wouldn't need to give her money to get an abortion because long live the NHS, that shit's free. So what she did with that money, I don't know, but next time an American film writer is writing something about the UK, do some fact checking, bitch. Do a little bit of research. So he says that he came home one day and that Paulina had decided not to get an abortion and she like taped the sonogram to his fridge? How she got in his house? I have no idea. Uh, but yeah, and then he's like, okay, cool. I guess we're having this baby. So she moves in with him. And then he comes home one night after a bender, passes out on the sofa, wakes up the next morning, goes into the bathroom and she's lying in a pool of blood. So she miscarried. And so the fetus died. And as a result of that, she can no longer have children and has been unable to accept it. And so her drug problem got worse. And so she's still in rehab. Just when you think it's not gonna get worse, it does. Julia pipes up and I was like, oh shit. This bitch is about to say some out of pocket stuff right here to make this guy feel better. She's like, he has paid his penance because he saved the life of a child. You saved my life when you protected me from Simon. So you saved the life of Tom's child, Tom being her dad. And then she crawls into his lap and she's like, I am your salvation. Don't you see? I'm that child. Oh my fucking God. How are you two so self-absorbed that you can make somebody else's tragedy 
a part of your fucking love story. Oh my God. This is the weirdest trauma bonding I have ever seen. It, it is wild. Does someone want to go check on Paulina? <laughs> She's probably having a really hard time somewhere. Oh, but we're not done. Because Gabriel then says that in order to, I guess, right this wrong, his original plan was to put Paulina into rehab and then go and kill himself. But it turns out that the night he was gonna go kill himself, he went back home, did a bunch of coke, was trying to OD on coke, which I still think is a needlessly expensive way to do that. And then he met Julia in the orchard where he molested her and then just woke up the next morning, decided that life was worth living and went and picked some apples. So I think it's time for a little word from our sponsor, Miss Deborah Cox. Honestly, I'm not joking. By the end of this, I was crying laughing. All right, so believe it or not, we're actually nearing the end of the movie, or at least the end of scenes that I can actually talk about. Because in the next scene, they go to Italy to like, I guess, attend some work conference for Gabriel, which terrible idea. Dude, you are still her professor. Maybe the semester's finished, maybe she's not gonna be taking your class anymore, but you are still a professor at the university where she is a student. And he like flat out says like, yeah, I wanna show you off. And it's like, you are fully pulling a Ned Fulmer. <laughs> That is a bad idea on so many different levels. Like, you know you're not supposed to be fucking her. Why are you gonna be parading her around in public like that? Mm -mm. Nope. You deserve to get fired. The audacity. They go there, they check into a hotel. Um, I guess they're trying to make the hotel look like real, real cute, but to be honest, it just looks like a Hilton. They've got a lot of white furniture and that's about it. And so, you know, since they're in Italy and this whole thing is about Italian literature, it's time for them to smash. And because of that, they decided to spend the last 25 plus minutes of the movie on one sex scene. 25 minutes, like this movie is like an hour and a half. And like the actual sex itself is like a minute. So they spend a lot of time just rubbing on each other, <laughs> undressing really, really slowly. And, oh, get the bingo card out, bitch. You better get that fucking bingo card back out because Gabriel is a fuck man. He's a fuck man, fucking called it. Nailed it, knew it. Julia's like getting undressed, right? And she's wearing these heels and she's like, I can keep him on. And he's like, maybe another time. And then he spends like a really long time like taking off her shoes. <sighs> footman, that's a footman right there. From an aesthetics perspective, like the scene is very nice, you know, it's really fucking long, but you know, it's, it's shot nice enough, maybe it was lacking a little bit of grandeur, you know? Gabriel is a very rich man and we've spent the best part of three movies getting to this point. So I guess I just wanted it to be a little bit more of an occasion. Julia's wearing a black lingerie set, but you know, there are no like Swarovskis on there. She's not wearing a nail. There is no robe. Gabriel isn't wearing a jock or anything. The hotel room isn't some grand manor. But I don't know. I thought maybe if you were gonna prick tease us for three fucking movies, you give us a little bit more of a show. And also this might be a little bit crude, but the hotel room that they're fucking on, everything is white and like all the sheets are white. And I'm like, this is her first time 
maybe white isn't the way to go, but you, you, okay, you know better than I do about what's going to go on down there. So, you know, maybe I should just shut my mouth. And then the scene ends and then the movie ends. And I'm like, but what about all the other plot points? You introduced this character of her ex in this movie and it went nowhere. You introduced the concept of like a police investigation into him and again it went nowhere. You introduced several concepts like you know their time in Italy at this conference for Gabriel's job and it went nowhere. This movie just started a fuck ton of plot points, didn't progress them at all, and then spent the last half an hour of the movie on one scene. You can't make a movie that is entirely designed to just set up plot points, progress none of them, and then spend the entire rest of the movie on one scene that is a hangover from other movies. Because then this isn't really a movie. It's just a setup for other movies and then a payoff from other movies. Okay, guys. That's it. That's literally the end of the movie. I'm gonna go put on my lashes, put on a look, and we'll have some final thoughts. Oh, okay, I am back. My evening plans got cancelled, so I just put all this on to take it off again. Not that I'm bitter about it or anything, because this is cute. Okay, so what did I think of this movie? I certainly hated Gabriel less than I have done in previous installments. I still think he's a whiny, dramatic ass bitch. And it almost feels like he's a robot that started to gain sentience. And it kind of feels like his character knows that he has to do everything in the most dramatic way possible for the benefit of like the imaginary audience. And you know, whilst the sex scene was decent, 25 fucking minutes. It was literally like the last quarter of the entire fucking movie. And you didn't wrap up or even come back to any of the other plot points that you introduced fucking six minutes ago. I guess it is a little bit jarring to be at number three and then just have a movie purely to set up the next trilogy. It feels like there are a lot of questions that are still unanswered. And I feel like since this is the third movie, this kind of represents like a break and then the next three are gonna be based off the things that they set up in this third movie, which means that they're just dropping plot lines that they clearly set up in number one and number two, which is a little bit annoying, but maybe it's because some of the actors didn't wanna come back. Who knows? But before we go, it's bingo time, baby. Let's have a look and let's see what we got. Steve can't go outside. Yep. Someone gets shot. No, didn't happen. We have a fight, which is nice, but you know, no shooting, no stabbing, no maiming. Someone got bit, but not quite the same. So, unfortunately not. Gabriel likes feet, got that one. Told you you look like a foot dude. Dom Julia sub Gabriel, didn't get it. Oh. What could have been? Orchard Cameo, got that one. Julia Stays Mild, got that one. They Bang, got that one. Gabriel is not really Italian, no, unfortunately. And then the final one is Black and Brown People Cannot Talk, which we got. So, at the end of it, I need to take three shots and you, my lovely viewers, need to take one, two, three, four, six shots. Send me pictures on Instagram and or Twitter and or TikTok and or wherever the fuck you can find me of y'all taking shots. I'm gonna put in a little snippet at the end of me doing three shots. And there we have it. That was Gabriel's Inferno part three. Thought of having to sit through part four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of this is, uh, is a lot. A lot of the stuff that they do is real out of pocket and I'm not sure that I'm gonna commit to it, but let me know in the comments if you do wanna see me review them. You never know. I do like passion flicks. I think they're fun. And until next time, as always, kisses from England. Bye guys. Na 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 tequila.
does too. Oh, been so good, Daddy. Oh.